Hello and welcome to this video on primitive reflexes and the Moreau reflex in particular. So today we are going to have an interview with Dr. Nagina Akhtar from Dubai. So I would like to just introduce you very quickly to Dr. Akhtar. So Nagina Akhtar received her Masters of Chiropractic degree in 2006 and her postgraduate certification in clinical proficiency in 2007 from the Anglo-European College of Chiropractic in the UK, which is where I met Dr. Akhtar. Her special interest being in neurodevelopmental delays and autism spectrum disorders. In her career as a chiropractor, Nagina has enjoyed providing chiropractic care to all ages, including babies and children, for the past 14 years. Now, it was through her personal experience with her firstborn son being diagnosed as severely autistic and non-verbal, and ultimately the deaths of her two babies in 2011 and 2016 to neurometabolic disease, that she developed a deep passion for helping all children, especially those with behavioral and learning difficulties, as well as neurodevelopmental delays. Now, Nagina has successfully uh, helped her own son, Danny, through intensively studying and researching known treatments for autism spectrum disorder over the past six years. Now, her son, Danny, who was once labeled to never be able to speak or to be independent, is now thriving in a mainstream school and is fully verbal and has a passion for boxing. Nagina has rigorously and continues to study several topics such as functional medicine and supplementation, functional neuroscience, neuro exercises, child development, brain stimulation, sensory motor integration, diet and nutrition, as well as chiropractic techniques including cranial adjusting. Now she recognized and applied the learned material knowledge and theories into a practical approach to children's health and started applying them not only to her own son, but to the children she's seeing and they have also benefited from this wealth of knowledge and skills that she has accrued over her time of study. So I welcome you now to enjoy this lecture or really this chat uh, that I had regarding primitive reflexes and the Moreau reflex from Dr. Nagina Akhtar. Hello and welcome to the Pediatric Network. As you know by now, my name is Mike Marinas. I'm your chiropractor and host here for all things evidence-based when it comes to working in the pediatric space. So I have uh, with me today, Dr. Nagina Akhtar. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, Mike. How are you? Ah, oh, not too bad. It's so nice to see your face. It's so nice to have all these chiropractic friends all over the world that you can call on to go, please will you explain something to us? <laughs> It's our pleasure. Thank you for, for considering me worthy of being on the network. Thank you. Oh no! You see, now this is the, now this is where it comes from because you're one of those chiropractors that I follow a lot on social media because you're always posting stuff which is relevant. You're always posting stuff which has which is really good content, and you have a focus uh, into primitive reflexes. Where did that interest come from? It's a personal journey with my son being diagnosed with autism at the age of three uh, and being told that he'd never amount to anything, he'd need 24-hour care for the rest of his life and he may never speak, drove me into this journey of trying to understand how the brain develops and how then I learned later through Dr. Robert Mulilla's work about primitive reflexes because there's not much information out there regarding primitive reflexes and, and the relevance and their importance of being integrated at the timely manner through neurodevelopment. Okay, so this is exactly the thing. So I think let's start right at the beginning because I'm sure we're going to have a couple of students on here. What is a primitive reflex? Sure. So in order to understand how the brain develops, first of all, we must understand that the brain is stimulated through movement. Um, primarily through movement, it grows. And when, we're, when a child is born and the brain is developed, um, it, the brain is born at 25% of its natural weight. Um, all the cells are there that you're going to need throughout life. However, only 25% of the volume is there. And there's certain genes that are regulating the development so that the brain knows when it's inside the body and outside of the womb. And this is really important because if the brain was larger, it wouldn't fit through the birth canal during uh, the birthing process. So it's really important that the genes come online at the right time. And these are called experience dependent genes um, and they are stimulated by light, sound, all the senses, so temperature, smell, gravity and movement. 
Um, and this is what drives them to be stimulated and allows the brain to grow rapidly. Now, in order for the brain to develop, we need movement, but the, at birth, the frontal lobe hasn't developed yet, nor has the motor co cortex. Yeah. So what is driving the movement? And what we need to understand, this is why the development of the brain is so crucial in our understanding of why primitive reflexes are important, is because that movement activity and that motor activity is coming from these primitive reflexes, which are automated movements, so involuntary movements that sit in the brainstem. And this is what allows for all of the senses to be engaged and allow for maturation of the brain um, at a timely manner. So, you know, we first have the basic, uh, the reflexes sit in the brainstem at different levels of the brainstem. So the very basic ones sit in the medulla and the more uh, higher ones will sit a bit higher, like the Brzezinski, which is one of the final reflexes to integrate. Um, and each reflex, as it integrates through the adequate stimulation that it will receive through the environment, through light, touch, sense, uh, smell, movement, gravity, etc. This will allow for um, the inhibition and the maturation of the reflex in order for the next reflexes to emerge in the brainstem. And these then inhibit the ones lower down. And this carries on layer by layer until all of them are integrated and the brain's developed, the frontal lobe and the frontal cortex will then take over and take over the whole brainstem. So we must also remember that autonomic nervous system sits in the brainstem too, which is our heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, etc. So unless we have adequate frontal lobe control after the reflexes have been inhibited, if they haven't been inhibited at their time, then what we'll find is that these children will have, um, or even adults, if, if it still remains to adulthood, which it does as well, they will have high, high heart rates and they'll have a lot more kind of sympathetic responses as well, like gut, gut dis, uh, dysregulation and um, kind of endocrine disorders because all of it's controlled at the brainstem level, but it needs to be controlled at a higher level. So we need to ensure that each primitive reflex, as it emerges, must be integrated with the right responses. Um, and, you know, as early as the basic reflex of root and uh, south reflex, which is the stimulation towards the breast, um, even if this is not uh, adequately um, integrated, we're going to have speech and articulation issues in the child. But also, if that is not present, uh, some children may have latching difficulties at birth. This is our first sign that there may already be a, a developmental imbalance in the brain already occurring. And Dr. Melilla talks about how these, um, a lot of these imbalances occur in utero. Um, so this is really important that we get the motor activity of the reflexes inhibited and integrated really at, at the time that they're meant to be integrated. Okay, so you bring up two really interesting things there. One is that it's not, these primitive, primitive reflexes are not things that just kick in at, at birth. These are things that are actually starting to, to happen uh, in utero already. And the second one that you brought up, which is fascinating as well, is that there, there are timelines for these things. It's not just they integrate or they don't, because they all work together with each other. So one needs to integrate so that the next one can have can integrate correctly. Am I following you properly? Yes, yeah, so it's just basically like layers of a cake. So this has, has Dr. Melilla refers to it as one will integrate, move up and inhibit the one below and move up and inhibit the one below. So um, it's like with the Babinski reflex he mentions is that the, um, this is a little bit controversial because some neurologists or um, uh, other authorities would say that this reflex stays until three years. Um, but Dr. Melillo um, says that or, or from his neurobehavioral disorders book um, in childhood disorders, um, he refers to this reflex should be inhibited by 12 months. And this is when the child should start walking. And so if there's yeah. any delay in the child walking, because the motor milestones are crucial in understanding the development of the brain and where these reflexes sit, because these we all have um, knowledge and all, all doctors that deal with children have knowledge of the primitive reflexes because they assess for them. And so, and the motor milestones, developmental milestones that we all assess these children for, are really important in understanding how the brain is developing because it's through motor um, uh, like movement that the brain is developing. Okay. The feedback to the brain is from the muscles.
and posture. So it's really important. So this is, this is something that I, I think you can enlighten me on now, is that that's, that's how you get movement. And movement is what feeds the brain, and that's what gets that frontal lobe going. But movement can't be organized in a baby yet. So movement has to be almost staged in these little bits and pieces, and they have to happen so that the next thing can happen, and so that the next thing can happen. That's fascinating, because also, like, I always think to myself, the primitive reflexes, they're, they're these amazing things, because a baby can't be counted on uh, cognitively to go, I'm hungry, and we'll go, I'm hungry now. So it has to, anytime food is presented, be able to have that reflex to go, I'm going to eat now. So it works on that level, but it's also this almost primary driver to get the brain moving forward. Absolutely. This is why it's so important that we assess for them and then help the child or the adult help integrate them through a series of exercises um, that you can do at home. Um, or in clinic with the, the chiropractors or any health care practitioner that you may choose to use uh, to help you in, integrate them. So, so that's, um, I suppose that is like the final little piece of that puzzle because it's wonderful to be able to assess and to go, yes, that's not working. And, and, I, and I remember uh, way back in the day uh, assessing a child and finding a reflex that wasn't that, that, that wasn't in uh, wasn't uh, integrated at the time was supposed to be integrated and I kind of went oh what does that mean um, and you kind of go does it have a specific meaning that's the question I'm kind of leading up to here if you have a reflex that hasn't integrated does that have a specific meaning was it kind of global to go oh hang on a second this might be sort of a delay issue or so I think with, with each reflex that emerges, we need to, each reflex will present with a, if it's not been integrated on time, will have its own manifestation of symptoms. There we which go. Which is the Moreau reflex. And that's like the Moreau reflex. And interestingly, the Moreau reflex is um, a reflex that is the first reflex at birth, which is also um, where the FPR, so the fear paralysis reflex, which is an interuterine reflex, merges into the Moreau from uh, at birth so it's the first reflex which you hear the baby cries so it's a startle response um you know where the baby startles um each parent will know that the child does it. if there's any quick movement or loud noises this is a fight flight response and again if this doesn't integrate your child's going to be under a lot of stress because the uh the fight flight response is going to create uh, raised cortisol levels it's going to create uh, raised um, adrenaline being pumped through the body because the body's in a state of stress the whole time. So the child will be anxious, the child will be nervous of um, change, so it will be an inflexibility of um, uh, different situations, won't be able to be uh, able to regulate that. And there'll be a, a weakened immune system as a result of that. These are the child, children that typically have like asthma and immune system uh, difficulties and um, they would have, uh, like, m mostly it will be kind of um, inflexible mm -hmm. to change and so forth. I get you, I get you. So this, this Moreau reflex, let's, let's dive into that. I think that's a, that's, that's, that's a really good idea. So as you, as you said, there is... There's this fear paralysis reflex, and and I remember, I remember, I think it was about a year or two ago where they talked about the Moreau reflex being almost two reflexes that they kind of worked out now instead of it just being the one, this uh, like a, a like a fear thing, but then it also had to do with that hairy mother. That's what I always I, I always uh, remember with the with the Moreau reflex where they talked about it was way back in the day where the where the child would kind of grab onto mom again and grab onto that hairy mom ape and just remember that they were kind of holding on there. Is that still the idea behind it, or have we kind of moved on a little bit from the hairy mother idea? Well, absolutely, it's it's still the it's still relevant because it's clinging on to familiarity and it's safety and it's alerting mom from any potential stress or danger. So it's um, it's whereby you know the heart rate will raise and the um, the breathing rate will raise and the child will be under a lot of stress. But it's to alert mom in the first early stages of this reflex. But if it persists, then we're going to have a few um, issues. It should integrate by about two to four months after birth. Um, and um, this can either, if, if left uh, 
if it's left unintegrated, we're going to get an overactivity of our sympathetic nervous system. But it's because okay. it's controlled by the, um, the frontal lobe. So that's like, I, I, I've seen quite a few moms that will come into practice and that will be like their dominant thing that they've come in to see you about. They don't quite know what it is, that they're, but they do know that their baby's about to fall asleep and then they get into this big response all the time. Um, and, and almost like they're worried about the response and they want to squash that response instead of having an idea of why that might be there. And then I suppose that's our job is to kind of unpack, look, it's a reflex. It should be there at a certain time. Um, and, and that's leading me to what I want to ask you now is, is it within that time frame where it's supposed to be there, if it is quite big, that moral response, is that a problem? Does that show like a dominant sympathetic child or, or is that something to kind of to leave alone? I don't think it necessarily means that the child, if it's within the time frame that it's supposed to be there, that's okay. But okay. If it stays there after the age of four months to six months, then we're going to be a bit more concerned. And the way we would integrate it at that age is to encourage that stimulus. So you would stimulate it for it to fully, uh, fully come out and then it will emerge and then you will inhibit it again. Is so that a... Stimulate it in order to... Yeah, is, is that an idea with majority of primitive reflexes that you really want to bring them out, almost get them to flower completely so that they can then... Integrate fully, yes. Okay, so okay. In, in children under two, this is exactly what you would do because a child cannot do it. So in, in, in younger children, they can do activities. So they would voluntarily do the, well, not necessarily voluntarily, but they can physically do the activity. But in children under two who may not be able to do the actual movement, the caregiver can do it for them. So they can stimulate the reflex in order for it to really fully present itself. And then it will enable it to integrate as well. Okay. What, what would the reason be that a moral reflex wouldn't integrate? Would there be a reason behind why that wouldn't happen? So sometimes this is, um, you know, like Dr. Miller refers to, it can happen in utero, some stresses in utero that may already cause a developmental imbalance, um, which may be present at birth, and, and then it doesn't integrate as a result of that. A lot of research shows that traumatic birth can cause um, a delay in integration of reflexes, a poor neonatal environment, so a child that may not be stimulated well or have some form of neglect. Um, and just being open to more infections that can allow the child to um, not develop adequately and improve in their functions or improve in, um, in allowing the reflex to integrate fully. Okay, so there might be a bit of a nature and nurture side to this as well. So it may be what you start with in utero and how that happens, but then that experience or that sort of like uh, that clay is then molded depending on your birth experience and it's molded depending on like perinatally and then postnatally what you get. And it's almost like then those reflexes will flower out only as much as they're allowed to within their environment. That's right. If so that's what... Stimulate, they're not going to... Okay. They're not going to emerge fully or, or integrate fully. So this is probably a good, a good reason for, because I mean, that, that's going to be hard for a, a parent to understand that it's a problem if there's a reflex and not knowing times or whatever. So that's one of these reasons behind having these well baby checks is to be able to go, look, this is something that we can pick up now and we can go, look, if we can integrate this for you now, um, I always kind of go back to like plagiocephaly, how many times on a well baby check I will see a roaring plagiocephaly. But the thing is, the baby's, the child's not in pain. Um, they're not expressing, or they might be expressing something like I'm guessing with Moreau, where it's, 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 that's not integrated. There's bits and pieces that they can kind of go, this is, not, this is not right. I can't put my finger on it. And obviously my child's not in pain, which is a big indicator to go to healthcare. But one, of the, one of the big things for the Moreau reflex present in a baby, or it was persistently staying, would be a lack of sleep. They would, the child would have difficulty in sleeping or staying asleep. Um, you know, and, and crying, so they may be a bit more colicky um, if it persists, uh, or, you know, the crying persists, and they'll be, um, you know, uh, quite hypersensitive to different stimuluses, so light, sound, smell, they may be, you know, it will upset the child uh, much quicker if they still have a moreau present. Sure, and coming in... 
an unsettled baby generally. Yeah, and, and as a differential diagnosis of an unsettled baby, that's something that should be in your toolbox to go, that's something I need to look at. If they're past that four months, because again, past four months, they really shouldn't have that unsettledness. That's where everything should start to integrate and the brain should start to be able to take over and they should start to be able to almost calm or balance themselves a lot better. That's right. Most, most of the reflexes will um, integrate by, by about six months and then we'll get the more postural reflexes coming online that will allow for kind of more sophisticated movements such as getting the child up onto you know, their, their feet and then low motion coming in after the rinse has been integrated. So um, it's so important for us to be able to assess these and then help the parents and the caregivers to uh, integrate them fully. Okay, so there is a lot going on with primitive reflexes and there's a lot to understand, I think, as well. So I think the first point, the first point of call, especially, and I'm kind of thinking about students here coming out of varsity because I can't see a lot of this kind of content being taught. I think this is kind of the things that you would then go on to and go and look at and then be postgraduate kind of learning. But I think the first thing is just to go and find out what are these primitive reflexes and then draw yourself that lovely map that we always have about when are they supposed to come out? When are they supposed to go away? And have that as your basis and then kind of build from there and build a good understanding of what, of, of what primitive reflexes are. Absolutely, I completely agree. I think it's so important. And there's many, um, you know, charts out there that give you the, like the Well-Balanced uh, Child um, by Sally Goddard is a great book to read about primitive reflexes, uh, when they emerge, when they integrate. But most people, uh, most of the um, authors that are in the field, like Dr. Malila, who talk about 10 primary or 9 to 10 primary reflexes, there can be up to 30 to 40 of them. Um, I work with mostly around 10 of the, the larger primitive reflexes in order to help them integrate because we don't want to overwhelm parents as well with so much exercise. And, and with the, the brain balance uh, centers, they, they also work along with uh, Dr. Kyle and Dr. Brandon Crawford now uh, with photobiomodulation and neurosage, which is like an interactive metronome. We know that these games can help integrate these read much faster. So there's quicker ways of doing them and getting great results um, much more efficiently now. So I yeah. look up. Uh, and, and the research is, is, is moving further and faster at the moment. But like we were talking about just before we came on here, this is not new to people like, and, 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 and the doc that, that, that our doc uh, is, uh, is referring to, Dr. Robert Melillo, um, just, just a powerhouse when it comes to this, this kind of stuff. If you have not looked up Dr. Melillo, I, I, really, I really suggest that you should. Uh, Disconnected Kids was the way I got into to reading about him. Um, and then I got that horrible huge green textbook which gave me massive massive nights of, of sleeplessness and just going through the first the first chapter going oh what is going on here it's so big that it's so eye-opening it's it's massive so i think everyone should everyone like any school every uh, healthcare practitioner should read that book disconnected kids and reconnected kids because that's pretty much what helped my son through the work that I learned in there, along with chiropractic neurologists in, in the UK, it really helped get my son back. Um, and obviously the nutritional input too was huge. So it's very important to um, look at the whole picture and make sure that we're giving uh, our children adequate stimulation and movement. I think, I think that is so, so important because I think maybe one of the things we get stuck on and I'm just going to talk personally from, from a chiropractic perspective is sometimes we get, we get caught up on the manual therapy and just to, and, and what that has to do. And, and it is part of, of the puzzle. And, and we see the research coming out now as to how much of a big part of the puzzle that is with, uh, with, with, with health. But there are so many other facets that we can get involved in exercise, like you're talking about these uh, and exercises to be able to get primitive reflexes back in. But then not to forget about things like nutrition, because it's such an important part. If you are trying to create a situation where you are moving a human forward um, and you're getting them to do these things, it's not just that one little push all the time. It's trying to look at them. And we always talk about holistic. And then we always try to do the one thing, and that always makes me a little mad, you know? It's like looking at it holistically. I mean, there's many tools. 
Exactly, exactly. And then the art of that is to work out when to use what, you know, and, and then it opens up this whole exploration for you. Like primitive reflexes got, got blown up for me when I, when I started doing my, my extra study at ACC and I met wonderful people like you. Um, and I started to go, hang on a second, there's a lot out there. That, that, I, that I could really have a look at. And that's why I really wanted to talk to you to, to inspire a couple of docs to go, you know what, just go out, read that Goddard book. You just read it cover to cover and get an idea of what is out there because there is huge amounts of, 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 of information. And like you were saying as well, like that white paper that, 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 that got published uh, look, looking at this stuff, it's massive. That, I mean, the that's credibility incredible. is just getting huge. Oh, it's amazing, you know, like 36% of the children showed 40% improvement in, you know, hyperactivity and inattention and spatial working memory. I mean, without medication, the only other time that was ever seen was through medication, given an optimal dose. So it's incredible because those changes have created neural networks to increase. So those changes won't go away. Like if you stop the medication, those changes would go away. Yeah, so it's an incredible uh, step forward without um, you know getting real results that will be sustained. That's what we want. It is absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal. Okay, to end off, I just want to get a little bit on that Moreau reflex because we did kind of go into it. So let's just give a little bit on that. So the Moreau reflex, what are we looking out for? What is the timing that it should be integrated, and what are we looking for in a child where it hasn't integrated? So what we're looking for in a uh, so it should be gone at the age of two to four months um, after birth. And what we're looking for is if the child is still startling, so the, the arms will go back and they'll take a sharp inhalation and then curl into a ball and then cry. Um, if this continues, so any sudden movements, if you're moving the child in a downward position or if there's any sudden movement or any kind of loud noises and the child startles and starts to cry in that manner, that reflex is still present. Um, so what we need to do is encourage that reflex to keep it, you, you stimulate that reflex uh, in order for it to really flower and then integrate as you nicely put it. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> oh geez, I shouldn't be the one putting out things. <laughs> <laughs> but that's wonderful. Okay, so thank you so, so much. This has been a wonderful little introduction to primitive reflexes. What are they? Why they're important? Uh, and a little bit of a chat on tomorrow. And man, uh, we are going to have you back if you will have us. And we'll talk through a couple of interesting reflexes. I think this is really something that we need to explore. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Mike. Lovely seeing you.